Um, thanks for that introduction, Courtney. I'll um, probably wander around the stage a little bit, um, try and avoid that spotlight a little. Um, so yes, today I'm talking about the Sandy Soils um, program, which stretches across the southern region in terms of um, covering the low to medium rainfall zones. It's a large collaborative um, project between CSIRO, Persa, Persa UniSA, Agroagronomy, uh, Mali Sustainable Farming, and also Trengove Consulting. Um, and the issue that we're dealing with is some of the challenges in managing sandy soil systems. So we know that these sands um, suffer a number of challenges um, or constraints within the soil system, including a tendency to naturally um, compact and become fairly hard for roots to, to penetrate and access moisture deep within the profile. We know we have chemical toxicities associated with pH and um, subsoil sodicity, um, as well as a fairly low inherent capacity to uh, supply and retain nutrients to the crop system. Alongside that, um, sands tend not to hold as much water as the other soil types, so we have some restrictions on the plant available water capacity through the season. Um, on top of the, the um, constraints within the soil system itself, we also have challenges to getting water into the profile. And that happens when our sandy soil systems um, suffer from repellents, which leads to uh, problems with moisture and establishment, having knock-on consequences um, for erosion and crop choice. So the aims um, of the Sandy Soil Program are to improve the way we diagnose and prioritize those constraints within sandy soil systems, um, and also to tackle um, management in terms of um, the profile interventions um, and also some um, more annual seeding type um, practices. I think the, the important thing to um, note within our constraints is that they do, um, multiple constraints um, come into play all at once and it can be very difficult to disentangle them and actually identify what is the primary constraint. And also depending on how the season plays out, um, the constraints um, are different within different seasons. Um, so the management toolbox that we're looking at includes both annual cedar-based strategies, often referred to as mitigation strategies. And these um, include the lower, to uh, lower cost type strategies, um, including sowing strategies, wetting agents, um, crop choice or fertilizer placement and optimization. But when we talk about amelioration, um, we tend to think more about the profile modification methods. So intensive um, profile modification, including this range of um, physical interventions, they're higher cost. We're looking to um, apply them at a less frequent manner, so every three or five years, depending. Um, and we're looking to specifically address those constraints and try and improve the soil environment um, for root growth. The geography of the project stretches um, across the EP um, all the way across to southwestern New South Wales. And you can imagine the sand types that we're dealing with across this geography vary a fair bit. And the different constraints come into play um, are fairly regionally specific. So I just want to highlight the broader program. Um, we have got four longer term trials which were set up before the program initiated um, and they're driven by Persa and also Sam Trengrove. Our new work builds on these trials um, and has implemented seven new research trials that incorporate the intensive profile modification as well as um, annual seeding brace strategies so that we can compare the type of yield gains that we can achieve through both the low cost and the higher cost approaches. Um, we also gained a variation last year, so we're looking at um, expanding um, the number of trials over the geographic area so that we can um, get a better feel for how these different interventions respond in different environments. So we'll be busy in the next couple of years implementing another 18 validation trials across the region. 
Um, a quick highlight from some of the long-term trials. So these are the Persa um, New Horizons trials at Karunda, Brimpton Lake, and Kadji. And what I want to highlight here is some of the results from the control, the spaded treatment, and then spaded plus uh, lucerne hay or organic matter. Um, I've stacked the chart so you can see the control yield in gray. Um, the blue highlights the, the yield gain that we've achieved through the, the spading intervention alone, and then the additional gain that's, that's achieved through the organic matter incorporation is stacked on top again in green. And from that, we can see that there are um, common components to the results across the different sands and environments, but there's also some contrasting results. So first of all, um, at Corinda and Brimpton Lake, we have um, a relatively consistent response to spading alone. These are cumulative yields over three years, um, but this response wasn't seen at the Kadji site. In contrast, we have um, a smaller yield gain from the incorporation of organic matter, but that is consistent across all three sites. Um, we suspect that the reason that Kadji hasn't responded to the physical intervention alone is because there's acidity at play and the spading hasn't actually overcome that um, acid throttle constraint. So these results um, highlight the potential for doubling gains um, through these types of interventions. Um, but they also highlight that we need to understand the constraints um, and also bring to question how much more can we improve those yields over and above what, what's reported in these trials. So the project framework um, looks, to build to, um, looks to bring together a better understanding um, of the yield potential at these sites and what we can achieve. Um, alongside the, the different um, makeup of constraints that come in, in to play at the site specific level. Um, our yield gap estimates are what I'd call a little bit fuzzy at the moment. Um, they are our best estimates at the moment. And over the duration of the project, we're looking to better define that plant available water capacity um, and inform the, the yield gap estimates. But on the whole, when we're looking at a growing season rainfall of less than 300 mil, um, we've got an estimated yield gap of uh, two to three tonne per, per hectare. Um, alongside the, the, uh, defining the yield potential, it's important that we also keep in mind what, what is the specific makeup of those constraints at the different sites going on. Um, so you can see from this matrix um, that the repellence issue and the acidity are more regionally specific issues, but physical constraints are very common in sand, and that makes sense because the sands themselves naturally um, compact. But the nature of that constraint can be severe, um, moderate or low, depending on specific sites. What's not within this table is that the physical constraints go alongside uh, uh, nutrient constraints in terms of the ability of the soil to provide nutrients um, to, the, to the plant. This um, schematic he, or data here um, describes the soil strength down the profile. So as much as we've categorized our sites, it's important to take a look at how the physical constraint plays out down the, the soil profile. And what I want to highlight here is the depth of maybe 30 centimetres, if we're thinking about in intervening um, through profile modification to 30 centimetres, how that plays out across different soils is going to be very different depending on where this bulge sits and where we're opening up the routes to then access. So it's very common across the data set that we have for there to be strong physical constraints within 20 centimetres and they reach severe level within 30 centimetres. Sometimes that continues a lot deeper and other times it really um, falls back. I've changed the way I've presented the data here, um, but it's the same penetrometer based data. Green is essentially good for go in terms of the plant roots uh, should be able to penetrate. Um, but when we start getting up to soil strength of two, we know that we're in the, the zone where uh, roots will be physically constrained. So anything yellow, we've got physical constraints. 
And what I want to demonstrate here is the different impacts of different types of intervention on soil strength. So we can see a rip to 30 centimetres provides very clean uh, rip lines with very little shattering in between. Whereas if we um, increase that depth and go to 50 centimetres, we've got a lot more shattering in between. So presumably more root access to nutrients and water down the profile. The spaded system where we're looking to mix the top 30 centimetres is far more consistent in terms of alleviating the physical constraint. However, the importance of how this interacts over the longer term is really what we're wanting to capture. So does the action of mixing actually uh, lengthen that effect over multiple years, or do, can we achieve that through the, the deeper ripping? Or conversely, is this not actually an issue, and do we get enough uh, deeper root penetration and water access through the, the shallower rip? Because the thing that we need to remember is every centimetre deeper we go, it's going to uh, require more fuel, so cost, and it's also going to start reducing the speed of implementation. So the depth question is really important when thinking about um, amelioration strategies. Uh, I'll present some results across three trials um, here, where we've looked at depth specifically. Um, so we've got control treatments, a rip to 30 centimetres and a deeper rip. In these two trial sites, the rips to 60, and in uh, the Butte trial site, where there wasn't an argument for going deeper than 50, we've just um, ripped to 50. And then we have additional treatments of spading um, within the car warp site to 30 centimetres and a topsoil slot, which is essentially your rip uh, line with inclusion plates as a comparison, particularly over the, the longer term. So these are first few results, and we're just looking at the, the comparisons um, of the physical responses. I should probably highlight this is last year, so the growing season uh, rainfall um, was pretty poor, particularly at Wakery and Car Warp. Um, but we can see that with a variety of different types of responses uh, to the physical interventions. So really with gains of between 0.3 um, and 0.5 tonnes across these sites, and at Car Warp in particular, there wasn't um, any gain from going deeper within the, the profile amendment, um, sorry, amelioration, which we do need to bear in mind that this was one season and might play out differently over the longer term. Um, the other data that we have for car warp, we have neutron probes um, established within the, the sites so that we can look at water use within uh, the profile through the season. And this data is demonstrating that although we did not get um, an increase in yield at car warp from the deeper treatment, we know that we've improved water, the root growth deeper and that they are accessing deeper water. Um, but this season, it didn't translate to yield, which highlights some of, some of our challenges. The um, trial sites also include nutrient treatments. Um, so alongside the physical intervention alone, we're looking to enhance nutrient supply either through amendments, so chicken litter um, or lucerne hay, um, and some of these treatments also have fertilizer match treatments so that we can start to disentangle the nutrient effect versus um, other effects within the system. So just to highlight the range of results that we get here, in the um, two very dry sites, we don't have um, positive impact from um, improving nutrient uh, supply within the profile. Um, I've only presented the one bar here, but that's consistent across whether it's supplied as chicken litter or fertilizer. Um, and then the trial site at Butte, although we've got um, a consistent increase from improving the fertility within that trial site, we can achieve that with surface applied chicken litter. And it doesn't necessarily have to be put deep within the profile. Um, these gains are the same as what it would be surface wise. Um, a contrasting, same approach, but um, contrasting site in terms of Murlong, as well as having physical and nutritional constraints, um, also has severe repellents. 
We're talking um, repellents that goes deeper than 10 centimetres um, with very high um, MED uh, results. So it is a highly repellent site, which is why we've, oops, targeted um, spading um, as well as a topsoil slot so that we're trying to get some um, better moisture into the profile through those methods. And the highlights um, from here are that overcoming that repellence through spading and mixing the topsoil is really key um, to getting the best impact of the profile amelioration. And in this case, it's only when we overcome that repellence through these approaches that we're also getting the gains from the, the nutritional aspect. I should caveat that by um, acknowledging that the topsoil slotting um, was a difficult process. So we haven't perhaps got the um, increased nutrition within the profile deep into the profile, um, but that's something again that we will work further um, on. So in terms of the levers that we have in order to manage nutrient supply in these profile modified systems, we pretty much have two. One is the depth of placement and the other is the type of um, nutrient uh, addition that we're trying to get into the profile. And to address that, um, we set up a trial in 2007 at Oyen in the Vic Mali, um, which looks at different types of amendments. Um, so the Victorian Mali doesn't have access to chicken litter and we're focusing on the types of um, homegrown amendments that we might be able to get into the profile to boost productivity and fertility again. So these just highlight um, the types of amendments that we are looking at and also that we're looking to balance the C to N ratio of that amendment to manage um, the mineralization and immobilization balance and therefore the supply of nutrient to the, to the crop. First year results um, are very predictable in terms of those amendments with high nitrogen addition um, are yielding significantly uh, greater benefits compared to um, the other amendment types. Um, we did have a small increase from spading, but we also know that we had some challenges with managing a seed depth, that's um, seeding, controlling seeding depth within the spaded treatments, um, which might have also borne out in a fairly small yield gain from the, the spaded treatment. The subsequent year, we're looking to follow um, the carryover of nitrogen from the amendment stage in the crop um, through to this uh, last season. So in terms of um, last season, as I've mentioned, it was a fairly um, poor season, but um, the results indicate that the spaded treatment um, was still yielding, yielding slightly more than the control. It's not significant, um, but the only significant response is in um, relation to the spading of chicken litter. So overall, over the two years, spading of chicken litter um, has doubled the, the yields at that site, but it's obviously not a resource that's available in the area. And we, we're um, looking to see what we can do to um, provide different options. So in summary, um, I've summarized some of the types of gains that we're um, observing in the table at the bottom. And it's really important that we do divide out across different sand types. So we, we're looking at um, physical gains of between 0.2 and 1 ton per hectare in deep sands that are physically and nutritionally challenged. Um, if we take a physical approach only, so the ripping or the inclusion um, approach in the repellent sands, then that gain is um, certainly smaller, but we can overcome that through a spading type approach, which then overcomes repellents. And again, the, the nutrients responses are highly variable, but we're looking at what we can do to manage those levers um, to change nutrient supply within the, the profile. Um, 
So, in summary, um, the project is looking to better define um, the yield gap estimates on sandy, to sandy soils to help provide those boundaries of what we're aiming for within the amelioration context. Um, it's really important that we keep in mind the type and the depth of the constraint, um, which will help us develop a decision framework guideline into targeting those primary constraints. Um, and therefore which machinery based options are most appropriate to overcome them. So for example, we know that overcoming repellents um, and, or, sorry, or acidity is more important um, and should be addressed before physical and nutritional constraints by themselves. The opportunities to optimize um, come into understanding the specific impact of um, the different machinery options on soil strength and also moisture through the season. Um, and when we look to further boost the fertility of the system, we're looking at the placement, um, the type of amendment and the depth to supply, um, to manage that nutrient supply. Which brings us back to if we want to um, fertilized to a new yield potential, then for the sandy soil environment, we need to improve that yield gap estimate so that we can do it most appropriately. And just 